Dr. John D. was terrified. Standing beside him, Bastet drew a sharp breath and shivered, and D. realized that she too was scared, and that frightened him even more. D. had known fear before and had always welcomed it. Fear had kept him alive, had sent him running when others had stood and fought and died. But this was no ordinary terror. This was a bone-deep, stomach-churning, flesh-crawling repulsion that left him bathed in icy sweat. The cold, analytical part of his mind recognized that this was not a rational fear. This was something stronger, something primal and ancient, a terror lodged deep in the limbic system, the oldest part of the human brain. This was a primeval fear. In his long life, D had encountered some of the foulest of the elders, ghastly creatures that were not even vaguely human. His research and travels had led him into some of the darkest shadow realms, places where appalling nightmare creatures floated in emerald skies or tentacled horrors writhed in blood-red seas. But he had never been this frightened. Black spots danced at the corners of his vision, and he realized he was breathing so hard he was hyperventilating. Desperately attempting to calm his breathing, he concentrated on the source of his fear, the creature striding down the middle of the empty North London street. Most of the streetlights were dead, and the few that were not shed a ghastly sodium glow over the figure, painting it in shades of yellow and black. It stood close to eight feet tall, with massive arms and legs that ended in goat-like hooves. An enormous rack of six-pointed antlers curled out of each side of its skull, adding at least another five feet to its height. It was wrapped in mismatched hides of animals long extinct, so that Dee found it hard to tell where the skins ended and the creature's hairy flesh began. Resting on its left shoulder was a six-foot club shaped from the jawbone of a dinosaur, one side ragged with a line of spiky teeth. This was Sir Nunnos, the Horned God. Fifteen thousand years ago, a frightened Paleolithic artist had daubed an image of this creature on a cave wall in southwest France, an image that was neither man nor beast, but something caught in between. Dee realized that he was probably experiencing the same emotions that ancient man had felt. Just looking at it made him feel small, inconsequential, puny. He had always believed that the Horn God was just another elder, maybe even one of the great elders. But earlier that day, Mars Ulter had revealed something shocking, something quite terrifying. The Horned God was no elder. It was something older, far older, something that existed at the very edges of myth. Cernonos was one of the legendary Archons, the race that had ruled the planet in the incredibly distant past. Yggdrasil had been a seed when the Horned God had first walked the Earth. Nidhogg and its kin only newly hatched, and would be hundreds of millennia before the first human eye appeared. The Horned God stepped forward and light washed across its face. Dee felt as if he had been punched in the stomach. He had been expecting a mask of horror, but the creature was beautiful. Shockingly, unnaturally beautiful. The skin of its face was deeply tanned, but smooth and unlined like if it had been carved out of stone and oval amber eyes glowed within deep sunk sockets. When it spoke, its full-lipped mouth barely opened and its long throat remained still. An elder and a human eye, a cat and its master. Which is the more dangerous, I wonder? Its voice was surprisingly soft, almost gentle, though completely emotionless. And although he heard it speak in English, Dee was sure he could hear the buzzing of a hundred other languages saying the same words in his head. Sir Nonos came closer and then bent on one knee, first to stare at Bastet, then to look down on Dee. The magician looked into the horned god's eyes. The pupils were black slits, but unlike a serpent's, they were horizontal, like flat black lines. So, you are Dee. The buzzing voices swirled in Dee's head. The magician bowed deeply, unwilling to look into the amber eyes, desperately trying to control his fear. A peculiar musky odor enveloped the Archon, the smell of wild forests and rotting vegetation. Dee was struck with the scent and realized it probably had something to do with the emotions he felt. 
He had seen worse creatures, certainly more shocking creatures. So what was it about the horned god that terrified him so much? He focused on the savage looking club the ancient creature was leaning on. It looked like the jaw of a sarcosicus, the super croc from the Cretaceous period, and he found himself wondering just how old the Archon was. We are delighted by your presence, Bastet hissed loudly. Dee thought he could hear the tremor of fear in her voice. I don't think so, Ser Nunu said, straightening. We, Bastet began, but suddenly the huge club swung around and came to a stop, its teeth inches from her feline skull. Creature, do not speak to me again. I am not here by choice. You. Sir Nunos turned its amber eyes on D. Your elder masters have invoked an ancient debt that has existed between us going back to the dawn of time. If I assist you, then my debt to them is wiped clean. That is the only reason I am here. What do you need? D took a deep breath. He bowed again, then bit down hard on the inside of his cheek to prevent himself from smiling. An Archon was putting itself at his command? When he spoke, he was pleased that his voice was steady and controlled. How much have you been told? He began. I am Sir Nunus. Your thoughts and memories are mine to read, magician. I know what you know. I know what you have been. I know what you are now. The alchemist, Flamel, and the children are with the Saracen Knight and the Bard behind their makeshift metal fortress. You want me and the Wild Hunt to force an entrance for you. Although the Archon's face remained an unwrinkled mask, D imagined he heard what might be a sarcastic note in the Horned God's voice. The magician bowed again, attempting to control his thoughts. Just so. The Archon turned its huge head to look at the metal walls of the used car lot. Promises have been made to me, it rumbled. Slaves. Fresh meat. D hurried on. Of course, you can have Flamel and anyone else you want. I need the children and the two pages from the Codex that remain in Flamel's possession. D bowed again. With the power of the Horned God and the Wild Hunt it commanded, he could not fail. I am instructed to tell you this, Sir Nanu said softly, moving its head slightly, looking down at the magician amber eyes glowing in its dark face. If you fail, your elder masters have given you to me. A gift, a little recompense for arousing me from my slumbers. The huge horned head tilted to one side and horizontal pupils expanded to turn its eyes black and bottomless. I have not had a pet in millennia. They do not tend to last long before they turn. Turn? D swallowed hard. A wave of stinking fur, claws, teeth, and eyes made yellow by the lights flowed down the streets, boiling out of the houses, leaping through windows, flattening fences, pushing up through sewers. Filthy, foul-smelling creatures gathered in a huge, silent semicircle behind the Archon. They had the bodies of enormous gray wolves, but they all had human faces. Turn, Sernonu said. Without moving its body, its head swiveled at an impossible angle to regard the silent army behind it, and then it looked back at D. You are strong. You will last at least a year before you become part of the Wild Hunt.